not leave real estate, find you the best rate. I'll do all Philly like Google Expressway. Talking to people who out of the tool. Hello, everyone. This is John Lee, your local real estate agent in the Philadelphia, greater Philadelphia area. We are in for a treat. We are here with Mr. David Burton, my former uh, physical ed teacher. He is a legend, everyone. I uh, wanted Mr. Burton to have you introduce yourself to everyone. And yeah, tell us a little bit more about yourself, Mr. Burton. Well, as John said, uh, I am a retired, now retired health and physical ed education teacher, 27 years in the Cheltenham School District. And I taught in Virginia for five prior to that. So I had a 30 plus year career teaching health and phys ed, coaching, and John Lee was one of the many, many students who had a positive impact on me and my career. Uh, my career, I was truly blessed with students and teachers and staff who made my job so much, uh, so much more enjoyable and taught me so much along the way. I also, 24, 25 years ago, founded a business called Life Seeds, which most people know of as Life Seeds Summer Camp. But under the realm of Life Seeds, I also offer team building and leadership programs and do some motivational speaking. So yes, uh, I'm retired now. I have a little more time to do things like this, to spend time with former students. And by the way, John would probably never tell you this about himself, but he is one of those students who I have nothing but admiration and respect for, great memories of being a student who always did the right thing, who was always a hard worker and made my job really, really uh, a blessing. So John, it's so good to be here with you today. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Burton. And I think uh, there's just so much to share with with you and I and, and, and so much of your history, the rich history that you have in the Cheltenham Township. I mean, you were literally with me from Myers Elementary, like literally Myers Elementary, um, and then obviously working your way up to Elkins Park Middle School. And then eventually I was like, what the heck are you doing here? You're in the high school now. So right. Um, if you could just like give our audience, because a lot of people in my class, I would say anything between, let's just say, 05 to maybe 08, like my class, they literally grew up with you. So I think this is so special for people in my age bracket where um, you were so impactful in so many ways. But I really want you to take this time to share a little bit more about your your story, like how you started, how you got in and a little bit more about yourself. Well, just to touch on the uh, the the what you just mentioned, that was a really special part of my teaching career in that I spent my first three or four years at Myers Elementary, and then I transitioned to Elkins Park School with your class and others, and then I missed you at Cedarbrook, but in the time you uh, between when you left EP and got to the high school, I also went to the high school, so yes, there, there are hundreds of students who I was with from first grade all the way to 12th grade, minus the two years at Cedarbrook. And it was really special. It was so such a cool thing for me. Uh, I, you know, people ask all the time that my kids or other people say, yeah, he's, he knows Dave Barrett. He's really, uh, they're actually close. He's close with little Dickie. And he's one of those <laughs> students that was at Myers and grew up and in, in, in together yep. right there in that mix. Um, so John, I, I, started off in uh, the graphic arts industry. I was a graphic artist and I decided that I wanted to do something different. I had always been involved in sports. So in my mid twenties, I took the savings I had and went back to school and got my degree in health and physical education. And I did everything that they, they told me to do, but I couldn't find a job. So I, I really had this vision that I was going to get a job at a suburban school in Virginia. I had been coaching basketball while I was in school uh, at a high school. I wanted a job there. I really pictured getting that job, coaching there for 30 years, retiring, having a gym named after me, and that would be my career. But I couldn't get a job. So my first teaching job was at a very small, unique school for kids with severe learning disabilities. There were 60 kids in the school. We had no gymnasium. We had no fields or facilities to speak of. And I took the job as physical education teacher and also the soccer coach. As a phys ed teacher, you go through training for sports. Many, I mean, I, I was exposed to uh, archery, badminton, bowling, volleyball, you name it, but no soccer for me. I never played. I never watched soccer growing up. And here I am, my first coaching job, real coaching job at a school where I taught was soccer. 
And this school was a co-ed school for students in uh, grades uh, K to eight. So I'm going to try to, one of the things that I think is important for people to gain perspective on is moments or times or, 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 or people that kind of changed the course or, or guided me in my teaching path. And I was lucky enough to have that experience in my first year as a teacher at the school. My soccer team was a collection of uh, boys and girls in gr in uh, grades, probably from third grade to eighth grade. And they played in a very unique league with about six schools that were similar in size with kids with learning and, and, and emotional disabilities and disorders. And on my team, I had a kid with Tourette syndrome. I had a girl that was a selective mute. I had a couple of kids who had been uh, um, seriously abused by their parents. I had all kinds of issues. I had a girl with cerebral palsy, and this was my soccer team. So knowing nothing about soccer, I had a book. Uh, I think it was called Fundamentals of Soccer 101. First practice, I'm in the parking lot. I'm reading the book. I go out. I do what I read on the pages. And I did that every day. Kids thought I was a guru. They thought, and I really knew <laughs> very little about soccer. Uh, what I forgot to tell you, they had had a team there for three years and had lost every game, not even tied a game. So my first year coaching, we tied two games. And the parents were so ecstatic over the the vibe that had been created. They bought uniforms for the first time. They created a booster club. And the second year, we won five of the eight games that we played and we found ourselves in what they they called the championship with the other school that had the best record and and we we won we won the game two to one and i remember that uh there's two or three moments in my life where time has stood still and that's one of those moments the game ended and here comes this little boy who's in who was in seventh grade at the time running towards me full speed we did it we did it i look on the other end of the field there's a, a another young man who's Mom and his, him and his siblings had actually been abandoned and lived. They were homeless for part of the school year. He's on his knees. He's got his shirt pulled over his head crying. And then I go to the center of the field and there's this little girl who never spoke at school. She was a selective mute, never talked to anyone. I'd never heard her say a word. And she's jumping up and down in the middle of the field, little blonde curls saying, we, we won, we won just talking to no one. And, um, you know, it all came together there. And then I looked on the sideline and all the parents were in tears. And um, I, I I couldn't realize at the moment what had happened. But uh, the game ended. The kids got their orange slices and their little trophies and they left. And I sat down and I, I had a tearful moment where I realized that I had I had encountered something that very few people will in their lifetime. And, and that was seeing people accomplish things that not only other people never thought they would, but they themselves never thought they would. And, and when I look back, you know, many of the teachers there gave me a lot more credit than I probably deserve. But what I, all I did was give these kids who came to the school in many cases as a last resort, it was expensive. It was a very unique approach to their learning disabilities and dyslexia. And so, so most of them, had very low self-esteem, had uh, behavioral issues as a result. And all I did was, you know, instead of teaching them how to play ultimate Frisbee, I, I just taught them how to throw and catch a Frisbee. And that was a big deal to these kids. Instead of teaching them how to play a complicated game of baseball, we played very simple one base at a time and taught them how to throw and catch. And little by little, uh, success by success, these kids started to grow in their confidence. And I guess it kind of came to fruition on that soccer field. And honestly, I, I just feel like God blessed me with that opportunity. And I realized in that very first year that the students were the teachers. Um, in, in that case, and in many examples throughout my career that uh, I, I provided an environment and whatever instruction I could, I don't consider myself an expert on anything. I made, made many mistakes along the way, but that first experience at that school provided me with a framework for the way I taught. And probably eight, nine years later, I had moved to Pennsylvania and I got a notice in the mail, a uh, graduation announcement from Virginia Tech. And it, I opened it, it said the graduating class of Virginia Polytechnic Institute. And it was from this little girl, um, her name, I won't say her real name, but her name was Emily. She was graduating as an engineer, the selective mute. And she wrote in there, 
dear Mr. Burton, I felt that you would like to know and be proud of the fact that I'm graduating as an engineer. And I want to thank you for nurturing my spirit when no one else ever had. And I thought, what a profound moment. And again, I, I, I feel like, you know, I was just a part of that process. It truly takes a team, a village. But so, you know, for every kid, and you probably will, you will learn this with your own kids, but we get feedback every now and then. But for everyone that tells you that, there's a hundred more people who you never hear from that if you if you're honest and you're other centered and you're selfless in your approach, I really believe that you will continue to impact others in a positive way. And and that's kind of how I've lived my life. That's kind of how I've approached it as a professional, trying to serve others. Don't get me wrong. I do plenty for myself. And I, like I said, I make mistakes along the way, but I really just want people to discover their greatness, find out who they are and realize that there's a place for them in this world to be their authentic self and be, be successful, whatever makes them happy. That's such a beautiful thing. I mean, I think we uh, talked, you know, off air about, um, you know, Tom Sexton, coach Tom Sexton, my former cross country coach and how impactful he was in my life and uh, my development, not just as a, as an athlete, but a student athlete and, and a man. Yeah. Um, there was so many memorable things that I can say that, uh, that, that not just me, but many students of the Cheltenham school district can say um, how innovative you were. Um, and it's such a great story that you can share those things because Similar to uh, Mr. Sexton, like um, he got into cross country uh, being a coach there, not because he wanted to. He didn't know anything about it, you know, and yeah. he developed uh, his innovative ability to really reach out to students um, because of his, you know, just of his natural knack of teaching. Um, one thing that I can say anecdotally to our audience, and I'm sure so many people can resonate, is Burton Ball. <laughs> let's be real that was the sport <laughs> that that was it still is was, they still play it at the high school john they, they still play that at the high school and we play it at life seeds it's still that's it's still uh, mo when you know a lot of people don't know it until they play it for the first time it's still the most popular sport that we introduce at the high school they want to play that more than anything we do other than basketball so, it's, yeah, the it's the best it's the i still know the rules because it's because yeah, it has handball yeah, yeah i still remember the rules yeah so yeah um so that, for our that audience means, yeah yeah go ahead i'm sorry i didn't mean to interrupt no I, no i didn't mean to interrupt you either but for our audience explain briefly what the concepts of burton ball was how you like implemented that game and like the story behind that because i know that a lot of people are jumping off their seats right now when i said burn ball <laughs> i'd like to think they're really that excited i don't <laughs> I, I just want to comment before i talk about burton ball on uh tom sexton uh, we we were so lucky as a school district and a school to have a man of of his character and integrity and wisdom for, with us for so long. I mean, his career spanned generations and he impacted thousands of people and families. And I feel so fortunate to be able to call him a mentor for me to have worked with him for our paths to have crossed. So um, I'm so glad that you had the opportunity to to uh, be coached by him, to still have him in your life. He's he's really a special, special human being. Um, Burton Ball, so really the kind of the same way I approach teaching, you know, I, I, I know that uh, physical education can be really intimidating. It's not everyone's favorite thing, right? I, I'm a sports guy. I love it. You, you're a sports guy. You probably love gym class, right? I'll say that. I'll use that term one time, gym class, but then I'll call it physical <laughs> education. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I was very um, aware of students who would, would prefer not to be in gym. Not every kid liked it. It was a very intimidating experience. So my thought was, instead of having, you know, I'll throw out some names, you know, the, the athletes having the, the Rashad Campbells or the, or the uh, John Brandon Lee Bing. or the Brandon, Brandon. Beans or yeah. the, I'm thinking of kids that were really great athletes. Cindy Gould yeah. was an incredible athlete and, and David Stern. And the, when we, most of the games uh, were conducive to those athletes having the ball most of the time, scoring most of the points. So my, my thought with Burton Ball was what can I, what game could we create? Could I create that would almost make it impossible for one player to dominate that would 
promote and encourage the ball to be shared, the opportunities to be shared. So that's that's really that was the main. Um, I guess that was my intention to create a game that would incorporate team play that would give everyone an opportunity. And so all of the rules, the time limit on holding the ball, the number of passes and dribbles, all of those rules were put in place to include everyone on the team in possession and, and, and give everyone an opportunity. And, and it worked, it was amazing. You know, uh, Rashad Campbell, Brandon Bean, John Lee gets the ball. He can't dribble the length of the court, jump in the air and throw it to the other John Lee or the other Brandon Bean. You know, you got to get rid of it. So you can't think of passing just to your friends. You know, we, you think about, you go to lunch, you go to class, you want to find your friend. And if it was left up to us, we would do that with everything. We want to be with our friends, but we don't learn about others. We don't learn about ourselves until we expand our um, our environment and the people we associate with. Sports provide that opportunity. That was Burton Ball to enc- uh, encourage including as many people as you could in the in the offense, in the transition, in possession of the ball, and uh, and I think that's why I think that's why it's so popular. And it's nonstop. There's no there's no standing around. Uh, so for the athletes, yes, they could run up and down the court. They could be involved. They could catch and throw. They could score. But for the non-athletes or the people who weren't necessarily comfortable in those positions or those uh, s- situations, they were still a part of things. Find some space and the ball will get thrown to you. Um, so it was, it was it's been a cool thing. Kids still love playing that game. You know, um, there's a part of your history in every part of the Cheltenham School District. And if you go outside on the blacktop, like literally the painted Burton ball, like, you know, the, I don't know what you call it, but the, you know, the boundaries are all, all out there. Yeah, they're still there. They're still there. It's funny. Uh, I think, I think it was Alex Posmontier. Do you did you know do you know Alex or was he younger than you? I, I actually interviewed him as well. So okay. yeah. So Alex yeah. at some point over the last three or four years, it may it wasn't when I announced my retirement. I don't post a lot on social media, but it was there was something that I posted about. And Alex, Alex, I believe it was Alex. He he mentioned Burton Ball. He still had his Burton Ball shirt from <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he and he put a picture of it online, and then of course several of your classmates or people in your um, kind of in that era commented they would give anything to have a a Burton Ball game reunion. Uh, how cool would that be? And and that's something that I have thought about doing multiple times is just putting it out there on social media. Burton Ball reunion game for anyone who attended Myers EP from two thousand to whatever. We're going to do it on this field on this day. Uh, I think that'd be such a fun reunion for everyone. Oh my gosh, I'll be the first person to play. I'm gonna tell you right now, Mr. Byrne, I'm I'm out there. Yeah, I still remember. I still remember the rules. Like of that's course. crazy. I, I'm yeah, sure like... it's not real complicated. <laughs> the game's not real complicated. Uh, we, the, yeah. at at Life Seeds at camp, we play it, and the counselors, right. you know, they, they every now and then we give the counselors a chance to compete against each other in front of the kids and. You know, of course, they like basketball, they like soccer, they like pillow polo, but they they, they prefer Burton Ball over everything. It's uh, it's just such an action packed, uh, enjoyable, rewarding game and high scoring. And, you know, you've got the unique face off that we call the scrutum. You know, I made up that word, but I tell everyone it's Scandinavian and, you know, it's it came from this, you know, Viking game. But uh, it's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah, no, that's awesome. So uh, a little bit more about Life Seeds. So as far as what you got going on, there is now going to be more attention to it since that you're now officially retired. So what do you got going on for that? Like, what's your plans? Well, so Life Seeds that you're referring to, I think you're talking about the non-camp aspect of Life Seeds. Mm -hmm. Over the the past uh, 20 years, I have conducted team building and leadership programs for a variety of organizations, schools, sports teams. Uh, I've worked with a group that Prashad Campbell works with that conducts uh, financial literacy workshops for the NCAA. I've worked with Comcast, with Merck, with a couple of companies in Virginia, uh, Achieve One, AJC. I've worked with a lot of area high schools and the uh the 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 workshops i've been limited um as i mentioned to you in our phone call i teach all year 
school ends, camp starts, and I have I had very little time. So I would do what I could when I could. And now that I'm retired, that has going that's going to be my focus for the next for the foreseeable future. So I'm going to I have um I have partnered with a a marketing group and I'm going to have a website, a new website. I have one that's archaic. It's never been something I've put a lot of time into, but I have a website, but I'm going to have a new website, going to have a social media presence, and I'm going to try to kind of increase my, my, uh, I guess, reach and do this as as often as I can while I still can. I enjoy doing it. I think there's, I know there's tremendous benefit in these programs. Uh, I don't have a ton of clients, but every client that I have I, I, they asked me to come back and that's always the, you know, that that's the best evaluation you can get, you know, can you come back and do this again? So uh, the workshops are, you know, they can be team building, you know, companies that want to overcome uh, barriers in communication and trust, or oftentimes they just want to play. Can we do a corporate play day? Can we do office Olympics? And those events are a blast. I did one in May for Comcast at the link on the field we had the entire stadium. That was a that was a really cool experience. And then, of course, the speaking engagements are it can be a keynote. It can be at a conference. But again, all of it revolves around the same thing: um, uh, the greatness that exists when all uh, exists within all of us, and helping people uh, discover the strategies and and the techniques and what what they need to do to be intentional about discovering that greatness. No, that's so awesome. Um, one of the things that I can definitely say is that um, there's there's just so much um, potential for this for this particular program, considering that how heavily invested you were uh, in the township. And um, I mean, how many years has it been that you've been working with the Cheltenham Township? I came it- to in 96. So 27 years. Yeah. Long time. Long time. Yeah. Uh, so, like, uh, summer camp is and we'll be in its 24th year. Uh, we okay. started in 2001 and so teaching for 27. So yeah, the, and the, and the township has been, uh, I, I, when I talk to people where I grew up, I, I, it's hard to, you know, there's a lot of cultural differences obviously, but mm-hmm. I think there's a rich tradition in this township. That's very difficult to describe. It's very unique and there's a lot of incredible, you know, you go to the high school and look at that wall of fame. And there's so many legendary figures that have gone through the Cheltenham School District and so many incredible families that make it uh, a great place to to be, to have taught in, to exist in. And, and a lot of my greatest memories in the past 30 years have come from the people, the families and the students in that township. So, yeah, it's a great place. Yeah, it's it's so crazy that you say that because sometimes uh, when I talk to someone and I I look at them and they look at me and we say we're both from Cheltenham, it's yeah. just it it's not like any other school. It's like there's an immediate right. level of rapport and pride that we have being yes. and from the school. Um, yes. So yes. I, I I can definitely attest to that for sure. Yeah, and and, and and you know, John, you asked me like what the programs are about, like what Life Seeds is about. Um, I think I mentioned this to you in our phone call, but I, I listen to um, podcasts. I read. I, I'm I'm a lifelong learner. I feel like you know the more I the more I learn, the less I realize I know. Uh, but I I read a book called Wisdom of the Ages by John, uh, Wayne Dyer, and there it's a it's an incredible book. It's sixty character traits: wisdom, humility, honesty, things like that. And with each one. He takes a character from history and they could be writers, politicians, uh, philosophers, presidents, former, you know, activists. And and they're everyone's in this book from Martin Luther King, the Langston Hughes to Mother Teresa, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, Michelangelo. And the 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 little chapter on hope is Michelangelo. And he tells the story about the statue of David, which is arguably the most visited sculpture in the history of the world. I think it still brings in $30 million of revenue every summer from visitors. Mm-hmm. It's a 17 foot tall statue. And when, when uh, Michael, Michelangelo was asked to do it, he was the third or fourth artist that had been approached about it. Leonardo da Vinci turned it down. Several other artists turned it down because they all said, 
the marble is cracked and flawed and they couldn't work with it. So this giant piece of marble set in a courtyard in Italy, exposed to the sun, to the wind, to the rain, to the snow for years. And finally, Michelangelo said, yeah, I can do it. And he created this incredible work of art that is thousands of years old. And when he was done, uh, someone said, wow, how did you come up with that, create that out of that flawed, cracked piece of marble? And his response was, it was easy. He said, the statue was already inside the marble. All I had to do was chip away the excess. And when I read that, it really resonated with me. And I tell people this story all the time. I feel like everyone has a statue of David inside of them, right? Uh, you're not born a leader. You're not born a champion. Uh, you have to be molded. You have to be led. You have to be taught. You have to be guided. And not everyone has the people and the resources in their life to chip away the excess to help them find what that statue is inside of them. So that if I, you know, using that anecdote and talk telling that story that's how i kind of best describe what we do at life seeds it's giving people opportunities to to reflect to experience things that make them look inside and connect with other people in a way that they never would have otherwise and say wow i i didn't realize i could do that or i never looked at it that way and so that's kind of the gist of what we do what i do at life seeds um if, if that makes mm -hmm. sense it completely makes sense. And um, what I can say also from like, I have so many stories that I can share with the audience here. One story I can definitely share as we got into high school. Um, I don't know if you, all right. So since you retired, Mr. Burton, I don't know if you rigged it in a sense where um, like people. So when I was a sophomore, right. Um, yeah. I don't know if you remember my brother. Kevin, right? My older brother. Yes. Yeah, dude, sure yeah, I yeah. yeah. So my older brother was an upperclassman. And I remember at 10th grade, you get to pick like sports, right? So yeah. all of the popular sports like uh, basketball, football, like for a 10th grader to get those sports, like it's almost nearly impossible. But somehow, like me and all my friends were able to get it. And I think part of that was, I don't know if you rigged it, but I, I would like to think that you did. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to think that you did because some of the other kids ended up having to go to like weightlifting class. You know what I mean? Like, yes, I forgot what other classes there were. Like there were other like nonsense classes and I was able to play like basketball, football, like all those like popular sports that like only upperclassmen had the chance to, you know, to play. Yes. Um, so you, you, I would like to think that you kind of made that arrangement for, not only for my friends, but for my family, because you were considerate for those things. Um, and that just shows a lot about your character. And to even go further down the line, just because I have really good memory, when we played football, some of the times you were the quarterback. Yes. And I think I think you know where I'm going with this, right? I don't know. <laughs> All right. But sometimes you'd be the quarterback. And when the game was close, or if if there was a chance for the other team to potentially win somehow the, the ball would, if I was, if we were playing offense, somehow the ball would magically just get intercepted. You were throwing dimes like the whole entire game. Like you're hitting it, Johnny on the spot. Like we're catching these balls. You're throwing it on the spot, but then just one magical ball just turned to be an interception. And then, you know, then, then you gave the other team a chance to win or, you know, to come back. And, you know, as a student, as a kid, you kind of look at it like, man, he fixed that game. Um, but, you know, as an adult, you look at it now and you're like thinking, man, he's trying to promote like um, community. He's trying to promote the, the, the level of character that he has to like really care for, for, for the students. And I want to share that with all the audience um, that level of, of, of a person you are, the authenticity of the authentic, the authentic value of, of, of you as a person in that way. So, so John, I have uh, to tell you two things. One, I don't know if rigging the class <laughs> is the correct term, but you, you said it was my character that got you and your friends into that class. And the reality is it was your character that got you into that class. There were always ways to, you know, if the cap on the class was at 22 or 24 and we saw John Lee and 
three or four other kids that, man, they make every class better because they work hard and they do the right thing. Let's um, let's see if anyone wants to switch to weight training or swimming or badminton, and then we can get them in here. And there was always a way to make it work, um, to put kids who honestly deserve to be where they wanted to be, where they wanted to be. So that was your character and the character of many other students that sometimes earned them an opportunity that may may have seemed, you know, a little, a little, um, you know, askew. Uh, and and that's, the last... that's, that's, that's well put, Mr. Burton. That's well put. Thank you. <laughs> you know, the football story. So the, the scorekeeping, that is a long running, almost joke and understanding among, among a lot of students and, and at Life Seeds. I even have kids at, at school last year during basketball or during team handball Mr. Burton, you you use a life seed scoring method. It, it, there's no way it's 11 to 10 or 11 to 8. And so I will reveal this. I will reveal this now for the first time. Yes, there were moments where the score may have um, mysteriously changed. <laughs> where where yes, uh, my accuracy throwing a football suddenly was lost. And I did it for the reason you described, not because I'm some great person, but because I really wanted it to be competitive. I wanted students to always feel that feel like they were in the game. And uh, but I never I never did it to the point that it altered the outcome. So my, my I, that was one thing that I that I held tightly to, like if I ever uh, altered the score slightly or changed my performance slightly it was only to keep the game competitive make kids who might start to be feeling down about themselves feel a little bit better but never to allow a team to win that wouldn't have won otherwise that was a big mm -hmm. that was important to me because it, that would have compromised the integrity of the game and i didn't want to do that but yeah i've kind of got a reputation of being a little creative with the scorekeeping and i guess that's if that's a legacy of mine it's so be it uh, the, no, the, I, I still is, by the way, we I played, believe it or not, even at 62, 61 last year, I I was still quarterbacking for teams and, and even kids now. It's not fair. You know why you can't. Have, I said, I look I look at kids like you. You play varsity football. I'm 61. How <laughs> do you think it's it's unfair that I'm playing? But it benefits you, you know, so I still enjoy doing that. That was another blessing of mine that I got to spend that much time doing a job where I got to play football, you know, things we do when we're a kid. I grew up playing backyard football and I loved every minute of it. Here I am doing it as, as part of my career, but it gave me an opportunity to connect with kids. And that, that was a real advantage, a blessing that I had that I could, you know, throw a football fairly well. I could shoot a basketball. Like those things gave me a little bit of street credibility, if you will. And, and uh, that was fun. That was always a, a fun part of things. Mr. Burren, uh, people don't know, man, or they know that you had you had a pretty wet jumper. That thing was that. Are you, is it still good? Like, are you still making some buckets out here? I, I, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, we 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 have this little running thing over the past twenty years. You know, kids would want to have they want to challenge you. You got it. Nobody can beat Mr. Burton in the shooting game. Now, as I got older, obviously, if we played one on one, it got a little tougher for me, and I couldn't keep yeah. up. But, uh. Yeah, I think last year, you know, the game is you shoot three pointers until you miss, and the first one to twenty one wins. And uh, right. the last, per the only person I think that ever beat me was uh, was Nick Die, uh, and he, I think he's he may have been a little younger. I believe he, I believe he was uh, a senior uh, when I was a freshman. Yeah, he, he played football yeah. at Sinus. He was a great quarterback in high school. I think he was the last person to beat me. I think a couple of kids got close, but, you know, last year I hit at one point, I think I made like 30. We were playing another game with the teachers, and I think I made like, I don't know, 27 straight threes. So I can still shoot a little bit, but, you know, I'm just shooting. That's all. It's it's not a little bit, Mr. Burn. You had like one of the wettest jumpers. Like you were you were like the white Steph Curry, like before <laughs> Steph Curry. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a stretch, but thanks, John. I'm glad you have that memory.
<laughs> oh man, it was awesome. Yeah, it was it was just so many memorable moments. Like I, I mean, I can go on and on and on. Like just yeah. just the memories. And um, as Thank I'm you. telling these stories, I'm sure people are also like relating in so many ways. So it's such a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. As you as you know, since we started this, when you talked about Myers and EP, so many faces and and moments have come to mind. And when I say I I was blessed, I was really blessed. Like I loved what I did. I really loved it. Even, you know, I tell everyone how's retirement. I love teaching as much the last day as I did the first, but um, mm -hmm. so a lot of things changed. It made it not as enjoyable. Um, the, the, not the teaching part, but uh, so, so many, so many special people, students. And like I said, families, and I have, I just have the greatest memories, which I, I would like to include all of them, but I won't. But some of them, I, I'm writing a book um, on my teaching career, and um, it's really simple. It's called uh, An Extraordinary Journey by an Ordinary Man, which I really oh. believe I am. But I was surrounded by a lot of extraordinary people and events that made my teaching career special. So a lot of those memories certainly will be included in that in that um, in that book. Yeah, I mean, before we wrap up, I mean, just to kind of go on that topic, uh, apart from, you know, Coach Tom Sexton, like, was there anyone else that was really influential in the in the in the school district or in your life that really made an influence in your teaching career? Well, I, I, I would have to say first, you know, I'm, I'm a I'm a uh, my faith is really important. And I feel like God has has not only blessed me with the ability to do what I do, but uh, incredible opportunities you know, I'm a lucky person in that I discovered my true calling and then got to do it for so long uh, with so many incredible people. So uh, I'm thankful to God for for all of the opportunities I had. If I start naming names, I'd be so scared that I would leave someone out. But mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Weinstein uh, mm -hmm. has Go always on. been a, a, a close friend and a really big influence in my life, um, man. I'm trying to joke, Mr. Kircher at EP, the principal. He was someone who uh, I I am still astounded at uh, his uh, ab leadership ability and the and the traits that he demonstrated as a person, um, how to not only lead others but treat other people. Scott Layer, Mr. Layer, another close friend who is an extraordinary human being uh, with exceptional talent as an athlete. Many people don't know because he never talks about it, but he, he was an all state basketball player and football player. He played basketball and ran track at Lehigh, uh, just an exceptional athlete, but an even better person. Um, my, you know, my parents, they, they, they taught me the value of hard work, my family, my wife, Kathy, and my kids, my kids have been, not only a great blessing, but a great motivation to me uh, throughout the last 20, 25 years, you know, one's 26, one's 23. And then I, I could start naming students uh, and you would be on the list, but so would 1000 others it, there, that mm -hmm. there's just uh, so many people that, uh, and I, and I, if, if you're listening, if somebody's listening, you didn't mention me, I'm sorry, but if I had had an hour i could probably start naming names and we would still be talking an hour from now so for sure for sure and and i just wanted to make sure that those respective people uh were, were, were given a shout out you know what i mean yeah um but but for our listeners i mean where can they really i i know that you're not as active on social media uh you know as as maybe some of the younger studs out here but where can our listeners really follow you or um, well um where, where can I they see connect with you Life Seeds um, Summer Camp has a has a Facebook page, but that's only for the camp. Um, I do have uh, Instagram, and I just uh, in March, like a lot of people, I found myself spending way too much time uh, on social media, so I I deleted um, Instagram, and then I just re reinstalled it. It's a uh, Coach Dave B, I think it is at Coach Dave B, and and I'm going to use that platform. Um, I do some life coaching for some individuals and and a couple of former students and a couple of colleagues. It kind that happened organically. Uh, uh, one of my friends' kids and and I don't consider myself a life coach, but I think people find comfort in uh, talking to me. Uh, they feel like they can trust me. And again, I'm 
a disclaimer. I don't think I'm an expert, but I do have a lot of experience. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and with that comes wisdom. And I try to share that honestly and humbly to the best that I can. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, there, you know, and, and look, you know, keep a lookout. I'll keep you posted, John, uh, because I do have intentions of expanding that social media reach and my marketing, my vision so that I can do this more often, um, with, with more people. So yeah, sure. that's in, in the, in the, in the, uh, near future to do that. Um, I've got a former student, uh, Dave Aaron, who who I'm going to work with, he has a company called Envision, and he's a pretty incredible, uh, creative young man that does uh, a lot of uh, marketing and promoting through video. He worked as the Ohio State basketball team's videographer for four years, so I'm going to work with him, and um, he does great work if you ever need something like that, but yeah. For sure, for sure, and uh, the parting question, uh, what was uh well, i mean was there a question that i should have asked you and if i didn't ask you a specific question what should i have asked you um i th i think you uh i think you asked great questions i think this could go you know we could i enjoy talking to you because it's been so long and uh i i i no i think you asked i think you asked great questions john i i just i think what's really important um, right now for everyone, and this is not rocket science and many people are already here in their minds, but to, to realize that yeah, life is, life is difficult. It, 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 it always has been, but you know, we're going through, um, unprecedented times now after the, the pandemic and the rise, the continuing rise in, uh, with mental health issues, anxiety and depression and, and all of that, um, leads to challenges that many people have a difficult time overcoming. But I would say to you, I would say to anyone listening that, you know, to be reminded that after some of our, or, or as a result of some of our darkest times and most challenging periods, we've had some of our greatest moments, both as, mm -hmm. as, 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 you know, uh, society and as individuals. And research shows that people that go through uh, difficult times often experience um, a greater resolve and a strengthening and confidence and they discover things about themselves that they wouldn't have otherwise. So, you know, the, the book, um, The Road Less Traveled, which has sold, you know, millions and millions of copies. It's an older book, but it's still very valuable. If you're looking for spiritual and, and psychological growth, I highly recommend it. But the first word, the first line of that book is life is difficult. And uh, he goes on in the first page to talk about that concept that life's difficult. It is a series of problem solving events and challenges and, and followed by peaks where you feel like you've got it figured out, where, again, you're then followed by more challenges. And the people that realize life is difficult, it requires continued problem solving and resolve and, you know, analytical and critical thinking and growth and a growth mindset if you if you know that people are happy but the people who expect it to reach that peak you know that plateau and think i made it and then ha be completely derailed by the next challenge and they they're disappointed that those things keep happening those are the people that struggle so you know accept that my that idea that yeah it's difficult and and you you will have great moments but you're going to have more challenges and if you continue to grow you continue to work on yourself and and most importantly, you love yourself. The world's tough and uh, it's full of people. You can just go on a comment section on any social media platform. You'll find all the hate that that you want. Mm -hmm. But uh, to, to I think it's important that we value ourselves and, you know, we serve others. We help others find their joy and and we'll find ours, too. So I, I can't tell you how great it is to see you. Uh, you look exactly the same. Uh, <laughs> congratulations a lot. on uh, on on about to on being a soon to be father. Uh, I Thank wish you. you well with that, and and I hope you and your wife, you know, um, have have a have a great. It, it's just going to change your life in a way that it's hard to describe. One of the teachers at at Cheltenham, when I had my first kid, he told me the day before he said, "Tomorrow, you're going to love someone." more than you've ever loved anyone and you don't even know them today they don't even exist and nothing described being a parent more than that like all of a sudden there's this human being that 
you have a love for that you never understood until you have a kid. So you'll be all a right. great parent. It'll be a great experience. I wish you all the uh, all the best with that, John. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Burton. And yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll definitely link up and I'm hoping that we can um, see each other soon. Yeah. Yeah. Let's have a breakfast or lunch one day. I'm retired. So my schedule's wide open. <laughs> I'll be glad. I'll treat you to lunch or breakfast. You you give me a call and we'll make it happen. All right. Let's do it. All right, John. Take care. All right. Mr. Burton. All right take care. Nally Real Estate, find you the best rate. I'll do all Philly like Google Expressway. Talking to people who added a 215, even a 267, who always helping like, oh, no time for no student.